Hey, welcome to the Speakeasy. I'm your barkeep, Jeff Belanger. This is the place where we can drink alone, together. We don't card anyone. There's never a cover charge, although your bartender does appreciate tips if you can spare it. Anyway, Hunter Thompson once said, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. And it got me thinking, man, maybe this is our moment, right? Maybe us outsiders have been practicing for a pandemic our whole lives. Maybe, just maybe, when times are weird, it's time to turn to weirdos, like us. My drinking buddy tonight is a fellow explorer of the strange, and I forget which paranormal conference that we met, but it really doesn't matter. We just kind of hit it off, because uh, I guess we're kind of like kindred weirdos. And I'm glad he's here tonight to keep us company. From the great state of Michigan, please welcome my buddy, John E.L. Tenney. Hi, John. Hey, Jeff. How you doing? Hey. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. So uh, what are you drinking? Uh, I'm, I'm drinking a uh, Hess Select Cabernet Sauvignon uh, 2016. Wow. The Wednesday, I believe. Yes, I believe. Um, Wednesday. These are huge bottles of wine that my sister gives to me for taking care of our parents. Oh, that's nice. Um, it's her I'm, attempt at doing something. <laughs> I'm what? It's her attempt at doing something to help me. Oh, dude, aren't family dynamics wonderful? Um, before we get too much into that, I'm drinking the Baxter Brewing Company Stowaway IPA, which uh, has been in the back of my fridge, and I'm glad I found it. Glad you guys are here. By all means, jump in. Shout out where you're from. You got Michigan people here, and we got Massachusetts people here, and we got Yay Tenny here. Hello, hello to all of you. Thank you, guys. And John, thank you for, for joining me for drinks. And your bar looks fantastic. My goodness. Thank you. This is my uh, a green screen of my home bar, Gasoline Alley in Royal Oak, Michigan, that I first went to when I was 17 years old. Oh, and so that's like a real picture of the bar. Yeah, yeah. And back then you were you were like in bands and stuff, right? Yeah, I was a punk rock kid and people told me that they would serve underage drinkers. So I went there at 17. Yep. And I felt some, I got pretty drunk. And I felt someone's hand on my shoulder and I turned around to kind of punch him. And it was my mother. <laughs> How'd and that so go? She dragged me out of there saying I would never go back there. And I promised myself I would always go back there. <laughs> well done. Well done. Oh, God. Drinking water, Joe. That's OK. Whatever you're drinking, it's all good. And uh, and there's Tim Rehan. We know Tim, two of my favorites. Oh, Tim, you're one of our favorites. Tim, you're great. He is. He's a sweetheart. Uh, we always see Tim down in uh, Southern Michigan at the um, the old mill um, the old and wherever else he's in. And then, and then we've got Australia checking in. Good to see you, Grant. Uh, you met Grant at. Hey, Grant. Good to see you. Yeah. So, so anyway, um, you take care of your parents, right? Full time. I mean, this is a huge endeavor for you, right? Yeah. I feel like what everybody is going through now is what, I started going through when I moved my parents in with me right. because they both are health compromised. Everything has to be clean. They don't go out very much. Uh, they have to be monitored all the time. And so I've been doing this for a year and a half. And then all of a sudden, everybody else has started doing it. And I feel like everybody's in my world now. <laughs> you know, I've worked from home since 2004 when I'm not traveling or whatever. And so on, on the one regard, like I'm used to this. Wow, that went down fast. We're only, uh, we're like three minutes in, John. I'll pour a bigger one. Yeah, you better go. You better go bigger. That's that's good thinking. And and but this is different, right? When I work from home, I I'll go out. I'll just go out and do stuff just to get out of the house. But um, this is this is a whole different kind of thing. And it's and taking care of parents. I mean, my parents are getting up there. In fact, they live in Connecticut, which is like two hours away from me. And I'm going to grocery shop for them because they can't catch this. They wouldn't, I don't think they'd survive it. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just, it's weird, right? It's weird to get to that age where you got to take care of your parents. Well, it's strange because my dad is my father and that that's, means uh, that, that that's means, profound, right? That's pretty profound. <laughs> uh, but I mean that in that he's not going, I mean, obviously older people aren't going to stop being who they are. So I have to, he wants to go out and garbage pick. Like that's something he's done his whole life. And I've been telling him like, you, you can't leave and you can't be touching people's garbage that they're throwing away. And that drives him insane. 
the biggest difficulty it comes with my mother because my mother has um, dementia and Alzheimer's. So I don't really know how much she's processing this. Right. And for her, like the horrible thing for her is that every day she wakes up and this has just started. That's scary. Yeah. And, and, and so what, I mean, what's a, what's a good day for you? Like right now? I mean, since, since we've all been locked in. Uh, a good day is everybody wakes up happy and healthy. Uh, I play music when they first wake up and get them wiggling around and moving and make them breakfast. And then once everybody's kind of clean and in their respective areas, my dad, that's the bedroom where he watches his iPad. My mom's in the family room watching the view and, uh, the talk and all those ladies shows that ladies watch. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, I mean, it's just, that's a good day. Like if my dad and I don't come to blows or like screaming at each other, like full on, because he doesn't want to be told what to do by his son. Yeah. And that's another dynamic, right? I mean, so we're all trying to navigate this, this new world and you've sort of been living it. Like you said, it, well, what's a bad day? Like, I mean, is it, is it totally depend on the, the disposition of your parents? Yeah, for sure. I mean, so my dad will wake up with his mind made up that he wants to go grocery shopping. Yeah. And then I have to wrestle, not literally, but I have to wrestle his keys away from him, keep him from getting to the car. Then we argue with each other for two hours. And then eventually he'll just give up and take a nap. Yikes. And then my mom will hear us screaming at each other and that'll spiral her. So then I have to spend a few hours getting her to understand that we're not, we don't hate each other. We're just annoyed with each other. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> so you smoke and you drink and you get through, Hey, we can smoke in the speakeasy because there's no laws here at all. It's nice. You can smoke in gasoline alley if you're in Royal Oak, but you can, it's only after hours and don't tell anyone. So I hope, is there anybody watching this? No, nobody. Okay, it's just us. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And, and people like your sweater for sure. Oh, thanks. Yeah. That's, you know what? That's one thing that I've done for my own mental health is waking up every morning and going through my normal ritual of like showering, putting on a tie, uh, putting on clean clothes, making sure that I'm like put together. Like that makes me feel a lot more normal than just kind of letting the days roll into each other and not changing my shirt for seven days. <laughs> uh, why are you looking at me when you say that? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. That's weird. <laughs> I get it though. Um, you're right. You need some sort of routine. Are you doing any sort of work like in the weird? Are you working on your lectures? Are you writing anything or is it just? Uh... Yeah, I had, uh, I, I decided finally, you know, there's enough on weirdlectures.com on the website. Mm -hmm. There's enough there to where I was like, I'm just, t it's already all written. Just put it into a book, like just take it all. Um, and then the thing that was really important to me putting it together is that I'm not changing anything in it. Right. So the date, the date is on it. And there's a little introduction that says like, I'm, I'm keeping everything the way that I thought it when I wrote it so that you can see how my ideas develop over time. Like I thought that that was an important kind of point to the book. It, it's funny, isn't it? When you, so the web lets us put stuff up immediately. You know, uh, if something happens this morning, by this afternoon, you can respond to it with either like a, a, a short tweet or a paragraph in Facebook or a full on essay on your website. And that's that's the world we live in right now. And, and what I love about it is it's such a snapshot. I've noticed uh, social media. I, I've I mean, I've always participated to some degree, mainly because like it's it's kind of like part of the job when you're when you're doing lectures and stuff. You got to tell people where you'll be, what you're working on, you know, all that other stuff. I get it. But I didn't interact all that much since this went down i feel like i'm paying so much more attention because facebook especially is like a mood if you can if you can zoom way out right and look at tons of posts and not zone you know zoom in on too many specifics you get to uh you get to actually experience uh the mood of the world right now right yeah. the, the mood of the internet which is uh can be good can be bad can be hopeful and, and that's been really interesting to me to just kind of like watch it because so much of, of what's going on depends on a story and which story you believe. I have some Facebook friends that believe this is all a hoax. It's yeah. made up. Nobody's dying. There, it's just a conspiracy to get certain people out of power or certain other people into power. 
dude, like, you know, that's, that's what's going on. Right. And that's, what's going on in everybody's little individual worlds. And that story is something that people like you and I understand, right? Cause stories are so powerful. They, they, they shape things. They make people go into buildings in the middle of the night, looking for ghosts. They yeah. make people try wacky stuff. And, and our whole economy really exists, uh, on belief, right? If you believe it's going well, you'll spend money. And if yeah. you don't, you won't. That's it. Yeah, I wrote a tweet, uh, I think last week that said, if you think conspiracy theorists are bad right now, uh, you're going to find them even more infuriating a year or two from now when they're telling you that no one died from this virus. Yeah. Because that's going to happen. Right. Like Everyone that died, like tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who died are going to be written off as actors. And there's going to be books about it and people on the lecture circuit talking about how there none of these deaths are real. And I mean, I'm from Michigan. So like Michigan right now is number third in the country for the infection rate. Um, Wayne County, which is Detroit, Wayne County by itself has more deaths than the entire state of California. And it's kind of maddening to us in Michigan, some of us in Michigan, that you hear about New York and New Jersey where it's terrible. And then you hear about California and then you hear about the rising like rates in Texas and in Chicago. But people don't talk about Michigan because our governor makes the president really mad. And so right. they don't even really talk about Michigan. And yet people here are just dying by the hundreds every day. It's it's a surreal landscape for sure, just to see how different people are dealing with it or not dealing with it. And I get it, right? So I get the economy works. Uh, and that's the strangest thing, right? Like suddenly we've all become real experts on the economy, like legitimate right. experts. You're like, oh, I'm going to go get it. No, I'm not going to do that. Like uh, I could knew nope, that guy's out of work. You know, like mm -hmm. our, we suddenly talked to just a few of our friends and you're like, oh, that person can't work because of course they're shut down and this is shut down. And so they can't spend money and then we're not flying. And oh no, right? Like it's such an intricate web uh, and, and FOMO. Fear of missing out, which is mm -hmm. driven so much of our economy, so much of our lives for so long. Like, oh, I got to be at this conference. I got to be, you know, at, at this event. I got to go to this this restaurant or bar. Um, I, I don't know if there's any FOMO anymore. I right? think for me, the thing that's most interesting when you talk about like fear of missing out is that people are getting a ton of what you and I are doing right now. Yeah. Like everything is being zoomed or stream yarded or just lot, like everything is happening this way and people are getting used to it. And I was thinking the other day about for people like you and I, who are in the entertainment industry in the sense of production work, like there are major networks right now that are realizing they don't have to spend millions of dollars to have a show on every morning that they can literally give someone a webcam and right. people will watch. And what's going to happen when all of a sudden the networks who, who have probably been saving hundreds of millions of dollars on sh television shows all of a sudden have to start giving that money up again so that they can fill studios with people and camera people and lighting people. Like, are they going to want to do that? Or are they going to realize like, oh, no, this is just the way it's going to be now. Uh, Kelly Ripa and Ryan Seacrest can just broad webcam from their houses every day. Like, and we'll save tens of millions of dollars every year. Yeah. And, and people are going to rise out of nowhere. So I started doing these speakeasies as soon as the quarantine hit like a few weeks ago, because I just I just missed my friends and I missed talking to people and I missed interacting and going to bars and stuff like that. And then when you when you started to uh, when I started to do this and, and I realized like, OK, this is not the same as being in person, but man, it's the next best thing. You know, if we can't get together like it's this is better than a phone call. Um, not as good as being together, but it is the next best thing. And I wanted to feel sort of social. And I know it lifts my mood when I do these things and I get to reconnect with you. Like, it's funny, you and I, we don't really talk much on the phone uh, in between, like, unless like one of us needs something, right? right? Like, which is fine. I mean, it's, it's okay. I mean, yeah. it is, it is what it is, but like we see each other at an event. We're just like, Hey, we catch up. It's easy to talk. We might, you know, chat at the bar or whatever. And, uh, and, and it's, and it's just like, we, it, it could have been 10 minutes ago. It could have been 10 months ago. And we just sort of like pick up where we left off. But I think that's for me, at least those people like that, people like you, that I don't have to talk to every single day, but I know the next time I see you, I'm going to talk to you. 
Right. Those are really the people that I get along with the best. Because like, like, <laughs> they're just, not around enough to like piss you off, right? <laughs> like, right. Yeah. If we talked every day, you'd be like, oh, go away. But I, I legitimately, I legitimately have like one my one of my best friends, Scott. We didn't talk for 10 years. And I was at a Starbucks one day and he was there with his fiance, who I had never met. Because they'd been dating for nine years. And he came over and sat down. He's like, hey, what's up? And I was like, nothing, what's up? And immediately we were friends again. Like, yeah, right. Because that's just our personalities where I know that I like you. You know that I like me, like, or we like each other. We're going to get along whenever we hang out with each other. We just might not hang out with each other for 10 years. Aaron makes the point. That's just how it is with dudes. I, I, I think there's a little bit of truth to that. <laughs> there could be a little bit of a gender difference there, but uh, no, I get it. I get it. We have friends that it, it, it doesn't take a lot of work or upkeep and you just sort of reconnect. And I appreciated uh, the first time I met you. I was like, oh, I've heard this guy's a good speaker and and I work hard at my own. I, I sat down. I enjoyed it. Uh, I liked hearing you talk. And um, and and I was like, wow, he, I, th you, you, I feel like you get it. You know what I mean? Like, you don't necessarily have all the answers, but it's super intriguing. It's amazing to explore. Uh, and, and, and you know this from you know this from what you do because you do the same thing, which is you have a sense of humor about how weird this stuff is. Yeah, like I appreciate people who are scholarly in their research and in their data collection and in their fact finding, but like an hour lecture where someone never cracks a smile and just stands behind a podium is going to destroy me. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, and, and I've also found that when you're a storyteller in front of people, like you have to move through an emotional spectrum, right? You can't mm -hmm. just be like, there's times to be serious. There's times to hit, hit a serious note. There's times to be sad. There's times to be funny. And if you can move through all those different emotions, uh, you're going to be more captivating. And, yeah. and that's, that's, what's so important about this because these stories, the very ones we chase, whether it's monsters like Bigfoot or ghosts and haunted places or UFOs or any number of weird topics, uh, there, it starts with a story, right? Mm -hmm. the, the first thing is someone heard something and they're like, oh, I don't know. That's probably not true, but there's enough in there that you don't totally dismiss it, that you just get a little bit sucked in and you're like, Oh, it's probably crazy, but all right, I'll go out in the woods with you. I'll go look for those those footprints. But Whoop. when whenever you that's the thing for me, like, I love listening to people's stories. Mm -hmm. And I know that some people might just be pulling my leg and they might just want attention or whatever. But you learn how to tell stories through listening to people tell stories. Yeah. So I love when people come to a table at a conference or they pull me aside at a convention. If I have time and they're like, do you want to hear something? I'll say, yeah, because I want to hear it because I'm a storyteller and I want to hear how someone else tells stories because it makes me a better storyteller. Plus, they might say something that relates to something I investigated 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And all of a sudden there's like a click flash and I'm like, oh, snap, that happened before. Like, and then it just compiles on. So it's frustrating sometimes when I see people in our our type of peer group where they don't want to listen to people's stories. Like right. that makes me really question their ability to relate information to people. I've, I've said for years, I said any paranormal investigative show you've ever watched from you know, 30, 40 years ago to 30, 40 minutes ago, it started because someone wanted to chase a story. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if it's not a compelling enough story, then they don't ever go in. You don't even get there. You don't even get to pulling out EMF meters before someone found a story somewhat believable. And that's that's what always got me. You know, when I started in this, you just went blurry, blurry, blurry. All about. come back. Where'd you go? Oh, there you are. Yeah, that was amazing. How do you keep your hair so short? I've, that's my other problem. Look at this, man. I'm, I don't know what to do. Do I, I just shave it? I here's I had a return. So there was a, a brief period of time from birth until the age of one when I was bald, and then from <laughs> and then from fourteen to sixteen when I purposefully shaved my head bald because it drove my parents crazy. And then by the time I was like twenty five, I started going bald again. I was like, oh, this I'm going to be bald again. And so like I got to a point where. I was just tired of like upkeep actually. 
Yeah, no, I'm I'm almost there with you because my hair grows fast and it's been uh, so Joe suggesting a mohawk. I'm not opposed. That's the funny thing, right? Like people are doing like, or you put the bowl on your head and you just right go around. Yeah. Why not? Who cares? I'm the only who's seeing me, but you and and our friends here. I mean, <laughs> it's all good to me. Uh, one of the things that's killing me though is. Uh, I've I've come to realize a few things about myself, and that's that. This has been a very introspective time for me. Uh, boy, talk about when things slow down, right? You 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 really learn who you are uh, more more so, right? Even more so. And I need an audience. I don't do well without one. Like every winter, and I, I don't know if it's the same for you. I'm guessing it's pretty similar. January February is probably a pretty slow time, right? Mm -hmm. Because of weather and stuff. You don't get booked a lot because right. you know it's it's a crapshoot. And, and, and so I know for me, like I kind of hibernate, I work on new stuff. I'm, 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 I'm doing stuff like that. And then by the time you get out there in like March, April, you're like, yeah, all right. You know, and then you go all the way until January again. And then a couple, like two months slowdown and I need it. I absolutely need an audience or I will die. And so part of this too, is just like, please let me talk to people. Let me, let me interact. Let me tell stories in some way. Um, because I know I, like people like us, we need that. And, and it's tough. It's tough to like not have the feedback of, of a, a whole room full of people, but I'm trying, I'm trying, you know, sometimes you get to get the feedback the next day in an email, I guess. Yeah, it's, it, it is super difficult. I've realized obviously there have been, I think four events that I've had I've canceled now. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know if it's speaking to groups of people. It might be part of it. But realistically, like I'm, and for us, I'm just being as real as possible. Like I miss hugging people. Yeah. Yeah. I because that's a big thing at conventions, like seeing people that come over and over again. I've made a lot of friends at conventions and conferences and like, can I get a hug? Can I get a hug? Can I get a hug? That's something that I haven't heard to the amount that I would normally have heard by this time of the year. So there's like a hug quotient and you're, you're far low, like you're, yeah. you're, you're way down. I get it. Uh, and that's the other thing. A lot of people in this, in that are watching us right now, they've, um, they're talking about the Michigan Paracon and Sault Ste. Marie. Yeah. I think you and I have been to like just about all of them. I, I missed, yeah. a, I missed a couple. Um, and in fact, uh, Corrine wants to know where did we meet? I think it was at that one. I think it was at the Michigan Paracon. It might've been a different one, but I think it was probably Michigan Paracon and it was probably seven or eight years ago. Or was it on uh, match.com? Uh, yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. And we just did, right. That yeah. was just the first date. Was it didn't work out. Right. Didn't right. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we met there. And so everybody's talking about it. Like we got to be able to get there. Cause that's such a big party and you're right. There's tons of hugging and there's these people that, man, you see them once a year. It's like this big dysfunctional family reunion that we get to have. And I'm really hoping that that comes through just for my own sanity. I mean, I think we all need it. Um, but it, but at the same point, this is such a weird thing, right? We don't have a playbook for this. It's not like snowstorms where you're like, okay, the streets are clear. It's good to go out again. Fine. Back to normal. Like at what point do we open the doors and are we going to go to that thing and just like wave from 10 feet away? Or are we going to hug? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's really strange to think about because the other thing is too, is for me, like I do have to go shopping. So I have to go shopping because of my parents. Like not everything can be delivered here. And I, I do get a lot of deliveries, but I have to go out every now and then. Right. And I sit in the car every time. Like I've maybe been out five times to go grocery shopping. And every single time I sit in the car and I have 15 minute anxiety attack before I even go inside. And then as soon as I go inside the grocery store, my heart is like thumping a million miles an hour. And I'm super hyper aware of everyone that's around me and what's going on and who's touching what and what I'm touching. And then I get back out of the car and I've been in the grocery store probably less than 10 minutes and I get in the car and I'm fucking exhausted. Yeah. No, I, I totally get it. And, and not only that, when you go grocery, because like, so for me, it's like once a week we're going out and it's usually gro grocery store. Like, you know, you try to do it at once, just do it at yeah. once in the morning. So then we can come home, take our clothes, shower, right? Like there's like a whole thing to it. And so, uh, but when you go out, if I spend three, four days at home and I've been real busy, I've been redoing my website. I've been working on some projects for me that, that are good. It's taken my mind off it. It's productive. 
But when you, and so you can almost forget that any of this is happening until you go to the grocery store and you're like, oh my God, I can't buy bread flour. I can't buy like Bisquick. Like I can't get stuff right. that we get and it's not there. And you have to be six feet apart and you have to wait behind plexiglass to get your grocery shopping done. And I'm like, this is, this is like nothing. This we're, we're almost into like Orwell's 1984, right? Like we are so close. The thing that really freaked me out was the first time I went to, when there was the first kind of big rush of people being like, stay at home, stay safe. And the first time I went to the grocery store, the grocery store near my house was pretty barren. There was almost nothing there. Um, people had just gone in and swept it and taken it out. Well, the thing is, is so I'm vegan. Um, the vegan and vegetarian aisles were stocked with food. Yeah, no one's buying veggies. Like, yeah, like, why is no one buying any of this? And I, they had these uh, vegan meatballs that come like twelve to a pack, and and the, the grocery store actually had them on sale for a dollar. And so I was buying all of these vegan meatballs, and I had them in my cart. And this guy walks up and he goes, "What do those taste like?" And I go, "They taste like meat." And he goes, "Why is nobody buying them?" And I go, "Because they're vegan. They're not meat, but they taste just like meat." He's like, "They're yeah. only a dollar." I'm like, "Yeah, just buy them. They're good, and they're actually good for you." Like just buy them. And it was, it was such a mind blower that like, there's all this food, but people don't want to buy it because it's not what they normally eat. Right? No, we're, we're struggling with the same thing. I will say this, uh, went grocery shopping today and same thing. Like we eat a lot of fresh stuff, you know, mm -hmm. peppers and onions and, and all the, all the produce. And for a while, like the, the freezers wiped out, the canned goods are wiped out, but the produce, whatever you were looking for, it was all there. I'm starting to notice the produce is not quite as good as it was a week ago. It's a little less fresh. Yeah. There's a little less of it. And I'm like, oh, crap, man. I mean, and and so suddenly you sort of understand it. I know we want to get the economy going again, and we want everyone to get back to work for so many reasons. Um, but we got to balance like the safety of the masses and also like not putting people into a panic. I don't know. This is like nothing we've seen in our lifetime, but it has happened before. And that's what yeah. st students of history understand. Yeah, it's, you know, so on Twitter, I was having somebody, somebody wrote to me um, a direct message about how this was a, a somewhat conspiratorially minded person. And yeah. they wrote to me about how this was the end of the world. This is doomsday. This is the end. And I was trying to talk them off of the, that, that ledge by saying, like, there was a time in our, dis not too distant past, but, you know, we don't remember it. But there was a time when the entire world was at war with each other. And that must have really seemed like the end of the world. Every right. major country in the world was bombing and killing each other. Like, that probably seemed like the end of the world. To this, it seems like it's the end of the world because we have to stay home for a couple months. <laughs> right. Like, this is just, like you said, it's time to reflect, become introverted, find the things that are wrong with yourself and try and work on them. This is some good time to do some personal work for yourself and figure out what you might have in you that needs to be done. Um, but the other thing is too, is like, the obsession that I've seen, especially with this one person I was talking to about the end of the world, is that, first of all, as a researcher, I can tell you right now because I have a file on it, I've lived through 72 end of the world scenarios and predictions. <laughs> 72. So like uh, year 2000, Y2K, I'm sure yeah. was one of them, yeah. and the Mayan yeah. calendar, right? Okay. Bop and yeah, like yeah. there's 72 yeah. end of the world scenarios that we have all lived through. Everybody that's watching this right now, you've lived through 70 of the end of the world scenarios. Wow. I only paid attention to maybe eight of those. I must have missed some. There's a lot of little I believe ones. you. I don't I really believe you because I know you're, of, you're into this. There's a lot of prophets who have yeah. predicted and then they readjust and they do yeah. that sometimes every year. Seventh day Adventists. Yes. Some people don't realize that's a whole religion based on on the great disappointment, right? The end of the world right. is gonna be this day. And then they're all waiting and they go, oh, well, it's still coming, right? And the, uh, the, the, thing is, though, the thing is, though, is that so there is a psychological, uh, interesting psychological concept of why we want the end of the world to happen, right? So sure. like human beings 
we know that we're all at some point in our lives going to die. Mm -hmm. And, and there's a, there's a seeming for a lot of people, there's a, a very unconscious, deep seated, um, purposelessness to it. Why did I even live? I'm going to die. I was without purpose. It's just all for nothing. But if you die during the end of the world, if you die during doomsday, when everybody else dies, and then there's nobody left to mourn you, and you saw it, you saw the end of the world, that gives meaning to your death because you were there when it happened. And so there is this weird little in the back of your head, if I could only see doomsday, if I could only be there when it all collapses, like you don't really want it, but there is something in your brain that's looking for meaning for your death. And so people kind of glom onto it. And because there's not a lot of introspection, a lot of personal insight, it comes out as being a doomsayer saying, this is the end of the world over and over and over again, without realizing you should just find purpose in your life right now. And, and you won't worry about the end of the world. <laughs> like death FOMO. I love that. Uh, <laughs> I've also thought, you know, back in 2000, when they had all those various uh, end of the worlds, not as many as you followed, obviously, but I always felt like it seems like we always need the end of the world to be just on the horizon. If, if for nothing else than our moral compass, keeping it in check a little bit and mm -hmm. also asking yourself, well, okay, I don't, I mean, the Mayan calendar and all that other stuff, like those dates have all come and gone. But if you, if you think, well, maybe just maybe the end of the world really is in like three years on, you know, at midnight on the third full moon or whatever. Uh, okay. Well, what are you going to do with your life? How are you going to live your life knowing that? Are you going to just give up now? Because three years is a long time to do nothing. You know, right. are you are you going to go try to like climb that mountain? In which case you should do that anyway. You know, right. are you going to write that book? Are you going to ask that person out that you've had a crush on for so long? Maybe that's just a good plan. And so if you need to worry that maybe there's like a 2% chance the end of the world really is just a few months away or a few years away. Okay. Fine. If that's if that's what spurs you into action, so be it. Uh, maybe that's why we we put those those things out there. They're almost like like traffic cones on the soccer field, right? They're not really defenders, but you can pretend they are. Right. I, well, the one of the mentors that I had years ago was a minister named Jack Cole, and he had a good friend who was this author named Og Mandino. Mm -hmm. and, oh yeah, yeah, and Og, Og. Yeah, and what, what did Og write? Because someone made me read one of his yeah. books. Greatest salesman in the world, uh, the rag picker, the return of the rag picker. Okay. Uh, tons of books, but yep, yep. I went, I went and saw Og one time, and and he was talking about not doomsday, but what you were just talking about. He was saying how much different the world would be if each of us thought that really deeply understood that tomorrow might be your last day. If we lived like that how much different the world would be, how much kinder, or if you even want to say, well, like I'd go crazy and I'd do a whole bunch of weird stuff. Right. So there's people who say that too, like, Oh, it's my last day. I'm going to go bonkers and like, just uh, run around naked. That's fine. But if you flip it and think, what if every person that you talk to, this is the last time you're going to talk to them. This is the last time you're going to meet them. Imagine it's everyone else's last day. How do you treat them? The world will become much more kind and much more caring. And the reality is it might be the last time you talk to someone when you talk to them every time you talk to them, because there are no guarantees. You're totally right. I um, I lost my brother-in-law to cancer in 2016. And it was a, a like a two and a half year I, I, battles, not the right word because he didn't fight. He just, just went down. Um, but he's the age uh, he died. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm almost like eight months away from the age he was when he died. So it kind of hit me like, wow, I mean, that, that could be me. Like where you just get this cancer death sentence thing. And I kind of used that to be like, well, shoot, what do I want to do with my life? And then I, I climbed Kilimanjaro kind of like in his memory. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I've done a number of things since then. And I've never been one to shy away from like wanting to do big things, but sometimes you need that reminder in the form of like a friend who did face the end of the world. It was the end of his world, right? I mean, it was, it was for him. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I think right now what we're looking at is we've got this time period where 
people are forced to spend time with themselves. You don't have the endless distraction of your job pulling you in eight different directions. You, you don't have like, oh, I got to buy the right clothes. I got to eat at the right restaurants. Like we're just left with ourselves. And on, on the one regard, I'm, I'm kind of in awe at, at some of the simplicity that's come into my life. Um, my daughter and I will bake bread, like homemade bread a couple days a week. You're one of and those people. It, we are. Yeah. Like we're like, we're practically, you know, like Quakers. And so, uh, but, but it's, it's one of those things where like, we'll be talking about it two days ahead of time. We're like, we're, we're making bread on Thursday, right? Like, oh man, <laughs> this is amazing. And then, and then we make the bread and it's so good. And it's, it's crusty on the outside and it's soft and chewy on the inside. And it's so, so good. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is the biggest thing going this week is homemade bread. And I'm like, that's kind of awesome. Right. I mean, that, that we can find the joy in something like that again, as opposed to I need really expensive tickets to a, a concert that is sold out. Right. I mean, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, again, I feel like everybody is now living in this kind of space that I was, I've been living in for a year and a half now because before it was cool, before it was cool. I was home yeah. isolating before it was cool. Um, the moments after my parents go to sleep, like all of a sudden I can sit in silence. So nice. I can sit in silence and like read slowly. Yeah. Or I can just put on some uh, John Coltrane or, and, and just sit in the darkness, put on some incense, sit in the dark and just be peaceful. Like, and yeah. it's really wonderful. And it kind of drives me crazy when people are like, I'm tired of peacefulness. Like, <laughs> you, like, like, but, the, but that's like, we, we, we need it. It's wonderful when I go outside at night and I know that uh, maybe we're just strange and weird, but I we love, are. I love going out at night and I live uh, about a quarter of a mile away from a major interstate. And I can't hear the traffic anymore. Like it's it's really beautiful, actually. I can it's just quiet at night. And I it's lovely. And I I wish that people could appreciate those small things. I I've noticed too, um I live just south of Boston and there's so many airplanes that fly fly over. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. really not so low that that like it's loud, but you see them. And there's very few right now. And I went out um, the other night. It was super starry out. And I, I live in a pretty good area for stars to begin with, but there were more, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, there's less, way less planes in the air right now, way less cars on the road. And it's worth going outside at night on a good, clear night, folks. Just even if it's five minutes, just go look up. Uh, maybe you'll see a UFO. I would tell people to, uh, oh, this is actually a good time to see UFOs. <laughs> Right, because because you're like, is that a plane? No, probably not. There's no one flying right now. You know what? I would implore people to, if they have backyards, this is a good time as any uh, for people to go outside in their backyards at night. If they, when was the last time? I'm going to ask you right now. Do it. When was the last time you were outside naked? Probably two summers ago. Yeah. Yeah. People should be outside naked more often, in my point of view. Uh, when, when we're done. All right. I mean, there's just something about it. There's something kind of beautiful. Oh, I'm not here. Beautiful. Get it. Take it. Take the call. Do it. No, it's actually. Uh, I'll uh, fill in. It says survey on the caller ID. I'll put it on speaker. Put it on speaker. No, oh, my, my dad got it. Mm. Oh, I'm blurry. Too bad. Okay. I just think, no, there's something about going outside and, and being an, a kind of naked animal. Yeah. The, the first minute that you're out there, you're super uncomfortable. And then like within a couple of minutes, if you can, if you can stand it yeah. within a couple of minutes, you're like, oh, this is kind of fun. So hold on. Uh, I have to ask you a question. When was the last time you were outside naked? Oh, uh, four days ago, five days ago. Four days ago. And, and uh, what time was it? Uh, late at night. Late at night, and you were just like, "Let me just go feral for a bit." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not walked a bad out, idea. Walked out on my back porch. I have a, a kind of backyard that's closed off, and just went and sat in the backyard on the ground. It was cold, but wonderful, quiet. 
And I have no excuse. I'm, I'm backed up against a forest. I mean, no one would see except the the other animals. We have a fisher cat that's been walking around a lot. Run wild, run free, Jack. Yeah. I'll, say, <laughs> I'll take a selfie for you. Like, Teddy. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, skinny dipping in the summer. Why not, right? Yeah, I mean, we forget that we're animals like to a certain degree. Um, and I think it's important to remember. I bet John neighbor John's neighbors love him. That's probably my, my neighbors. It's so funny to me because my, I'm sure like I have a, I built a um, standing stone in my backyard. So I built like a Stonehenge stone in my backyard. Right. Um, and, and what do you do with that stone? Oh, I go out there and do like magic rituals and stuff and like witchcraft. And, Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure my neighbors absolutely think I'm totally nuts. But like I watch my neighbors, like I have my next door neighbor mows his lawn every day. And that is way more bizarre to me. Like, than running naked. Than running around naked in your backyard. Like naked, you're just an animal running around naked in the woods. Like this guy mows his lawn every single day. The yeah, same. Yeah, it's super strange. Yeah. And so I'm sure he's like that crazy stone in Tenny's backyard and you go out there with candles. It's crazy. And then, like, the next day, he's out there mowing the same lawn he mowed the day before, the day before, the day before. But isn't it totally freeing when people think you're a little bit off and crazy to begin with? There's no expectations of you. Like, we had, I'll tell you what's great. Go we ahead. had, in Michigan, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, we had a giant uh, meteor explosion um, that was about maybe 50 miles from here, but it exploded over kind of Oakland County where I am now. And it shook all the houses and everything. And I didn't know what it was. I actually thought that a truck had hit my house because my house shook so bad when it exploded. And so I ran out on my front porch to see what was happening. And all my neighbors were out on the front porch on their front porches. And I'm standing there and I was looking around and slowly one at a time, the neighbors started calling out my name, Tenny. Tenny, Tenny. And then they were like, what just happened? What just happened? And I realized, oh, when something fucking weird <laughs> happens, everybody in the neighborhood thinks I know about it. Right, right. <laughs> that's that's the aliens yep. being flown by Bigfoot uh, in a haunted ship. Obviously, they're just yep. they're making contact. Clearly. Uh, no, I get it. it. But I've noticed, too. Like, so my most of my neighbors know what I do. And uh, and they, they're like, oh, that's that crazy guy that's into ghosts and all kinds of weird stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's it's uh, it's totally freeing, right? Because like any weird eccentric thing I do is immediately dismissed. Like, well, that's just him. Like, there's no expectations of normalcy. So when when you set the bar where you set it, uh, it's really quite freeing. So running naked, they'd be like, oh, that's just Jeff, probably like doing research or something. I had. Right? A I tell a story that's happened last year, which I uh, I had some deer bones and I was cleaning them and gotten them from my property and I was cleaning them on my back deck. And one of the neighborhood kids rode up on a bike and he was like, Tenny, he's like, what, what are you doing? And I was cleaning bones. And he looks at me for a second. And he goes, human bones or animal bones? And I looked at him real hard and I was like, you know, humans are animals, right? And his face just totally changed. And he jumped on his bike and, and like drove away as fast as he could. See it Halloween for trick or treat. <laughs> right. Good, good times. Yeah. No, that's so funny. Uh, yeah. What are, are you, are you like a, a celebrity in your neighborhood? Are you uh, like that guy, that guy, Tenny? Yes. I'm that guy. I'm, uh, you know, it's really super strange because neighbors that I kind of wave at, Sometimes during the summer, uh, will for some reason feel the need to come knock on my door and tell me when a rerun of one of the shows that I'm on is on. Oh, right. So they'll be like, "Hey, uh, just want you know, I you're on TV right now." And thanks. And then, as if I either care or worry about that. Yeah. But sometimes it's like, oh, oh, I should make contact with that guy because he's like a TV person. Like I feel like that happens too. Where people think that that's something special because you're on TV, and you know, you know as well as I do, like it's not. No, it, and it's it's funny too. Like, so I mean, you've written books, and you know the work that goes into writing anything, whether it's an article or a book, right? It's it's hours and hours and hours, and you do like a, a twenty minute TV interview, and everyone knows that, and you're like, oh, yeah. that was like not even one day of my life. That was like half of a day of my life. 
Um, and, but that's the thing everybody knows. And, and I, I guess I look at it as like, well, it's an opportunity, like get to know me, get to know my work. Like if you want to yeah. know me, listen to my podcast, listen to my lectures and programs and, and, and come to my website and read my books. Like that's me pouring everything I can into, into what I do, as opposed to just someone asking me questions and looking for sound bites on like something weird. Yeah. There's a, a guy who works at a gro not a grocery store, a little party store. Uh, near my house who like three years ago, I was promoting uh, a Halloween event that I was doing on the local news. And so like, that was like three years ago. Yeah. And all he knows is that, Hey, Halloween guy. Every time yeah. I come into his, like three years later, I'm still just Halloween guy. Darn right. Darn Cause right. He, Cause he saw me in a 45 second segment on the local news. Yeah, no. And, and it's, uh, yeah, it's funny what people know you for. And then they, that's what they care about. And, um, and on the one hand too, I know for me, um, so I just finished writing my memoir about Kilimanjaro. It's, we just finished the edits with the publisher. It's going to come out in March of 2021. So almost a whole year to go, but like, it's, it's, it's been so much on my mind and it's a very spiritual book for me, but it's very little paranormal. And everybody's worried, like, will your paranormal audience want it? And I'm like, do I have to be the, I mean, I love the paranormal. I will never not love the paranormal. Right. There it is. I said it, but do I, can I be someone else too? Right? right. And, and so I'm praying to God that this book allows me to be, yeah, I'm still the ghost guy. I still love ghost stories and haunted places and weird stories, but like, but can I be this guy too? And, um, and that's a funny thing when you get, you, you feel like almost pigeonholed, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, can you do something else? Do you, do you worry about that? Like being able to branch out or the things that interest you beyond the paranormal that you're like, boy, I would really love to go explore that. I don't, I don't know because be, like one of the things that people have always kind of jumped on me for is I've had a bazillion jobs and I, whenever I want to do something, I do it. And mm -hmm. so people are like, what do you do? And my response has always been, I do whatever I want to do. So Someone came up to me once at a paranormal convention because I have a book of poetry that's you can buy it on Amazon somewhere. Yeah. And and it's just straight poetry. Like, and and they're like, this has nothing to do with the paranormal, but I loved it. And I'm like, yeah, I just had poetry in me, so I wrote it and put it out. And then I have a children's book that has nothing to do with the paranormal. I had a little story in me about my cat, and so I wrote it and put it out. Um I I don't ever really feel pigeonholed. I people want to pigeonhole you though. That's yeah. the big difficulty, right? They want to call you the ghost guy. They want to call you the Bigfoot guy, the UFO guy without realizing that we're all multifaceted, that none of us are just one thing that we do what we want. And in the best case scenario, and we have different interests. I like building uh, models. Uh, I like reading horror fiction. I like writing horror fiction. Uh, like all of that stuff, anything I want to do, there's a, a ton out there. And, and like, I'll tell you this, uh, this is probably interesting. I don't, maybe to me, but it's always bothered it's me. It matters. Um, like whenever I'm, I had to do a television thing, no one will show how fucking goofy I am on television. Like they won't yes. let me laugh. They won't let me joke. They won't let me be the weirdo that I am. And then people meet me and they're like, oh, you're so fucking weird. Like you're funny. Like you tell jokes and stuff. I thought you were this weird shadowy figure uh, that th is always serious about your research. And it's like, no, that's a cultivated idea and representation of me created by networks. And right. yeah. No, uh, you know, like we've been to tons, tons of these events. Um, Dave Schrader and I have done um, like so many paranormal events and conferences over the years where we do these ghost hunts and we joke around all the time. We have so much fun with it yeah. and we've loved, we, we've tried to like talk to production companies and stuff and said, look, this is goofy and it's okay to be goofy. We still take it seriously. We still think it's a serious subject, but like, we're just not serious because, oh my God, the world is so weird and so strange. No one wants to hear it. And then, so ghost brothers came out, right? The ghost yeah. brothers show. And I'm like, okay, well, how come they're allowed to have fun with it, but not us, right? Yeah. We've been having, I mean, they get it and they're great, by the way. Like they're super fun in front of audiences and I, yeah. and, and I love what they're doing. But uh, at the same time, I'm like, look, I think it's okay because paranormal television has gotten to the point where it's like everything has to be darker than the show before it, right? right? Like, like if you're looking for demons, we're looking for Satan, right? And yeah. if you're using like, 
conjuring spells, we're going to do a human sacrifice. This is going to be snuff TV. We're going to kill someone, right? Yeah. And, and and at some point, like you, you know, how far, how much further can you go with it? Uh, and and to me, the next step is just to go the other way, to just kind of like have fun. But I don't know. I, I mean, I don't pretend to know what what networks want. It's just um, it's just something I've noticed that when you're out there. And you know the people that do this stuff, and and your friends with your friends with a lot of the same people I am, like they're really fun people. Otherwise, yeah. we wouldn't be friends with them, right? Like if they yeah. were just like serious, buttoned up people all the time, we wouldn't hang, right? But they're yeah. funny, they're hilarious. Yeah, it's super strange that I mean, when you are constantly dealing with murders and death and uh, the horrible situation that created a haunted location or might have created a haunted location or the traumatic experiences of a UFO contactee, like your response to it a lot of times is to find that release in making a joke about it or, mm -hmm. or trying to lighten up the mood. And that almost never gets showed on television. No, and, and I know for me, like working on Ghost Adventures for 11 years, uh, sometimes we work on some pretty dark stories and I'm researching all day long, like just the worst of humanity, serial killers and stuff like that. And I, I've, I mean, at the end of the day, like I got to get that off of me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like that's a dark place, you know, stare long into the abyss. The abyss stares back. It's true. Uh, like I, I've, I've like gone, I've, I've taught, told my daughter, like, can we just color? Can we just like get out the crayons and color? Cause I need that right now. I need to literally decompress that way or joke around or like watch silly cartoons and uh, anything to get out of that space. Although I do think it is, I see the importance of going to that space because mm -hmm. if we don't talk about that dark, awful stuff, if we don't expose it, uh, it'll keep happening. I mean, it's going to keep happening anyway, but at the very least, I think some of the purpose of these, these haunts and these stories is kind of like a cautionary tale, you know, just, yeah. We, we talk about it because like there are monsters in the world, like for certain, like for absolute certain, there are monsters in our world right now doing horrible things. And we want to watch for them because we don't want our kids to be near them. We don't want our loved ones to be near them. We don't want to be near them. I think, though, that one of the mistakes that networks have made is in thinking that because there are ghosts and graveyards and haunted houses and it's dark that paranormal research has somehow has something to do with darkness like what we do as paranormal researchers has to do with more life like you're not interested you know people have died yeah. that's the reality that's just that's it but what we're looking for isn't more death we're looking for more life like that's the positive aspect of what we do that doesn't ever get covered in research What's that? I, oh, yeah. I have a crush on Mothman. All good, Jill. No judgment here. But 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 you you see teams and websites and Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts, and it's all terrible, bloody, drippy fonts and uh, gravestones and bats and black t-shirts. And the reality is, we're not we're not negative people. We're positive people. We're looking for more life, not more death. I totally agree. And I think it's funny how, uh, so, I mean, I can't speak to your childhood, but I remember having sleepovers at a buddy's house and there was a, a cemetery across the street. And as with most sleepovers, we would sneak out in the middle of the night. It was the greatest thing ever, right? It's like, we're not sleeping and we're waiting, waiting, waiting. It's like 1230. Parents have been in bed for a good long time. And we're like, all right, we can get out of the house and no one will know. And so number one, getting out of the house, like huge, oh, we're out, right? We're free. Right. It's dark. It's night. Okay. Now next we're going across the street to the cemetery because my God, where else are you going to go? And so we sneak into the cemetery and there's dead people all around us at our feet. And there's this one grave and I don't know how much truth there is to it, but it's like, if you knock three times on this one particular grave, right? The witch comes out and there's like three, four boys standing around. We're, we're like nine, 10 years old. And just daring each other. You do it. No, you do it. No, you do it. You know, and you feel so alive yeah. in a graveyard at midnight. Your heart is racing. Your heart is pounding. And you're like, 
No, no, it's crazy. There's no witch that's going to jump out. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Okay. Right. And then, right. And then you're, you're running. The witch may have jumped out, may have been there, John. I would never know because I had already right. turned around and I was halfway across the county. And, and that's the thing, right? It's, it's, uh, you feel so alive and you laugh and you're like, oh my God, that was amazing. So much more amazing than if we had just gone to bed. I yeah. still want to do that. But the thing is, too, is like, that's the point when I was talking about networks and what they think people want to see. Like, yeah. they think that people want to see that horror of walking up to the gravestone. But the funnest part is pushing your friends toward the gravestone and then laughing and running back home yeah. after you've like knocked on the gravestone. Like, there, it has to be a, a holistic package. Like you have to show like there's all this nervousness and trepidation and fear and legend and all of this, this mystery behind this thing. But at the same time, what you're doing is super goofy and you're having fun and you're doing something that maybe not everybody is going to do in their life. And then you run home screaming and giggling and then talk about it for the rest of your life. Or, or turn it into a career. Right. <laughs> there's that oh god and i love it like how cool is it that uh we get to make any sort of money at this whatsoever you know you I make mean, money at this not a lot no yeah. <laughs> but i mean enough to like keep the lights on Ugh. sorry am i bragging am i bragging right now flossing how much wine do you have left uh a little bit up oh, light i just wanted to turn a light off Oh. You made me think about uh, uh, paying my electric bill. Oh yeah, isn't that that's a thing, isn't it, dude? It's so it's so weird right now because like on the one hand, I, I, I'm not gonna lie, like I'm enjoying certain aspects of this lockdown, right? I'm enjoying um, working on my stuff all day, mm -hmm. you know, because like I, I mean, I've got deadlines and I've got stuff that I, that's that's my job is to like provide for others and then they pay me. I mean, that's mm -hmm. how it works. But suddenly I'm like, no, it's just me and my things all day long. And and uh, and I'm trying to find uh, th the joy in that and be like, OK. But then I also there's days, man, where I don't want to get out of bed at all, like at all at all. I just want to lay there and be like, I can't do this again. I can't just get up just to get back into this bed again at some point tonight. And that's been hard that um, those days have been few and far between, but they're happening. You know, what do you what do you do? I mean, do, do you have those days at all or is it just me? Um, and you're gone and you're gone. And that was that. Oh, that was the question. okay. Um, no, I, so when we, t we were talking earlier about personal doomsdays and stuff, like, I think that one of the things that changed me was, so for people who don't know who are watching, like I died when I was 18. So I had a random heart attack that kids have when sometimes it just happens. And I really do try and live each day like it's my last. Like I wake up in the morning and I am super happy that I'm awake. And then I realize like I have to take care of my parents. And there's a moment of human exhaustion where you're like, oh, I have to take care of my parents. But then I realize like how many people don't have parents to take care of. And I'm like, oh, I get to take care of my parents again today. And then when I'm making them breakfast, like trying to make something special that they've never had, uh, you know, how can I chop up these strawberries? How can I put this syrup on? Like, that's the work that I think everybody needs to do is to be able to find that in every moment and everything you do, like even when you're bored, even when you're tired, even when you're exhausted, like this is the gift that of life that was given to you, whether you wanted it or not. And as far as we know, this is your one go round. And so why are you going to waste a fraction of a second being terrified or mad or angry? Like, even when I lay down to relax, I'm like, this is beautiful. When I wake up, I'm like, holy crap, I got up out of bed. Yeah. No, I know. And, and believe me, like I, it's not, it's not often for me <clears throat> to have those days. Um, but they do happen. Uh, yeah. they do happen where you're just like, I, you know, it, it's tough thinking about getting through that day. I've noticed for me when I'm productive, when I'm working on something, um, the day goes better and I feel good. 
I feel happy when I'm doing these things. These have helped my mood so much. And I know um, I've gotten some wonderful feedback from people for just doing these speakeasies. I'm like, thank you. But really, I think I'm doing them for me. Right. Like <laughs> I I'm, I feel less isolated when I do these. It's, it's awesome to talk to you. It feels almost like we're in Michigan. Right. Like we're right. at some conference at the bar and just kind of catching up and and. And I need that so much because it, it it helps me get through tomorrow. It helps me get on to the next thing. So and I, I posted a thing today on Twitter, which was, again, from that mentor I mentioned earlier, whose name is Jack Boland, right? And mm -hmm. so Jack's big thing, he used to have something called a mastermind group, which is where a bunch of people would sit down and we'd all tell each other our problems. And more minds thinking about one problem can usually solve a problem. If you're just trying to work it out in your by yourself, you're going to roll around the same ideas over and over, construct with people around you. But one of the things that that Jack used to say to us was, if you're having a problematic situation, if you're in a hard situation, if you're having difficulty, the secret wisdom is to surprise yourself. Surprise yourself with your strength surprise yourself with your creativity and surprise yourself by doing all of the things which you think you are unable to do. Surprise yourself. Like that's the wisdom of these moments right now. When you think that you can't, you can. When you have difficulty finding a way out, then you find a way through or around. Like that's the creativity of your mind that ev all of our minds, each of us is a Picasso, a, a, an Einstein, a Mozart, like we have it in us. You have to find it and you have to cultivate it and work at it. And for me, like I have a lot of, I have a lot of dancing to learn. Everything is a dance and I fall down often and step on my own toes as I'm learning the dance. But the, the thing is, is like, I enjoy learning the dance. I didn't think that I would want to, take care of my parents. Like I had to completely reorganize my entire life. I had to change my whole life. I had to stop going out. I had to stop dating. I had to do all of that, those things. And I had to stop how I woke up in the morning. And what I did was I surprised myself by learning how to do new things in a new way. I get it. I do. And I try, and most days are good days. I, they really are. Like I said, I'm making bread. I'm making bread this week again. <laughs> I'll send you some. How, and and you've you've killed the wine. I'm out of beer. I think that's our cue. I think that's our cue. I think that's our cue. Jeff, thank you so much for having doing this. I do love talking to people. I do love these moments that we might not have gotten. Um, yeah, because we wouldn't I, have done this. Yeah, and I think it's important for people to hear other people talking. And yeah. knowing that other people are still out there. I agree. And that's why I'm going to keep doing these. If anyone's watching tomorrow at 1.30 in the afternoon, I'm getting a guitar lesson from a childhood friend, John Judd, who's a musical composer and teacher. And I'm like, dude, let's talk music. I'm going to get a virtual guitar lesson. How cool <laughs> is that? That's cool. <laughs> I know, right? Like tonight's Tenny, tomorrow's a guitar lesson. Like I got a, I've got, I've had a great week so far. Like that's pretty good. Yep. That's totally pretty good. Appreciate all you guys listening. There's been a bunch of people watching and chatting. I'm sorry we couldn't mention all of your comments, but um, but but thank you. Thank you, John, for doing this. Thanks for connecting. And yeah. uh, and folks, again, if you want to tip your bartender, there it is. Venmo tips are accepted. There's the, uh, the Venmo if you're feeling like it, because times are tough, John. This is what we're doing. Yes, it is. Trying to keep the electricity on and uh, and wondering what the next move is. Yesterday, I interviewed comedian Mike Brody and... Uh, and, and it was a great discussion. Anyone can go rewatch it on Facebook or on YouTube or on my website. And one of the things he said is, I'm like, man, stand up comedy. Come on. Like that doesn't work through, <laughs> right? You need an audience. You need the feedback, the immediate laughs. And he gave such a great answer. He's just like, yeah, I, I don't know what comes next, but we just got to figure it out. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, damn right. That's it. That's what we have to do. And that's what all of us have to do. We just have to figure it out. Right. You want to yep. you want to talk to people? Figure it out. You want to perform? Figure it out. Right. That's what we're doing. Can I give my last little. Uh, Do it. You can go. We. I mean, you know, it's it's I'm not like you have. Thing, I'll go take care of my parents. It's time for them to go to bed. OK, um, go ahead. My grandfather told me years and years ago, if you were born on a planet, a flat glass. 
you would eventually beg for a mountain or a valley or a tree or a rock to get into your way so that you would have something to do. You would be so bored walking around on a planet of flat glass. Luckily, we live on a planet where there are trees and valleys and mountains and difficulties at every turn. And so you should appreciate the lessons you can learn from climbing those mountains or going through those valleys or climbing those trees or stumbling over those stones. Amen, brother. Good thoughts to leave you. Folks, until next time, please take it easy.